Uh, before we start, I want to acknowledge country. I'm sitting on Darwell country, as you know. The background picture is my favorite spot in Darwell. It's uh, behind Mount Nebo, looking over to Mount Kira. That's where I take my kids for for picnics, and sit on the sit on the country and enjoy it very much. That's our daily walks. Um, I want to pay my respect to elders past, present and emerging and if any indigenous students or colleagues are amongst us, welcome. Um, if you don't know what country you're sitting on, there's, a, there's great tools available on the internet so you can find out for yourself um, and acknowledge it because we're not all on Darawa country. We have people from Deakin University here and we got people from, well, I don't know where you where you're all sitting, but some in Victoria, some here, some in Sydney. Who knows? Um, so we're gonna present today on um, the entrepreneurship and innovation round, and it's gonna be um, kind of like the the uh, Aces Legacy session, and I'm I'm extremely proud of the three teams who raise the bar yet one more time you have really great consistency and very high pitches to expect no pressure of course no pressure and sam did the, the sam did the um, outline for us so you know that's thanks sam so that was for me was a curly one i didn't know who to send in first second and third so you just you just chose it that's great um the difference this time is that we also have uh, students participating from across EOW. So they're all PhD students, but we have, uh, we've introduced some interdisciplinary or multidisciplinary, whatever the latest phrase is uh, on that. I can't distinguish the two anyway. Coming together, we have people from social sciences, from other engineering um, um, areas. Uh, we have people from business as well joining in. Uh, to deliver on the pitch or, or to participate in this. This is the last one. We kicked this off in, I think, July. Um, and so students have been working extremely hard. And how we do it is initially we're trying to find topics. And so the students come in, they look around their lab and they're, they're identifying things. Uh, that is surrounded in their in their research environment to then uh, bring together and put them into groups and then they start discussing and it kind of we're, we're spending time crystallizing the opportunity and then of course they're not just learning from myself they're also learning from a whole range of colleagues across university and uh, across um, industry so we have we have guest speakers we have uh for example uh, i see here thanks for putting your camera on george but we have uh, george's team running a workshop on ip uh, and patents and they have to prepare their first pitches and pitch to also people like um, the i accelerate and they're all contributing and kind of give stimulation input into their business models i'll pass over in a second i think the the relevance of these um is, is undoubted and what really, um, I don't wanna underestimate what the students are actually producing here. Um, if you think about last year's, last year's round um, actually stimulated a discussion and if I'm not wrong and go and correct me if I'm not wrong, some of the student work actually now contributed also to for a larger grant application with Maria's team um on on the energy stuff in in remote australia so what you're producing can go a lot further than you might think and um you know if it feels right in your belly then it's probably a, a good thing to pursue further um i pass over to the first team um and they're all geared up with a great background i pass over to uh, i transcribe and uh, if you want to quickly introduce yourself and, and take it away for, for the day. Yeah. Hi, everyone. We are iTranscribe. 
yeah, we design a solution for transcription. That's why we have this name. And our teammates are all from different disciplines and we are all current PhD students. Hope you enjoy our presentation today. Okay, I'll get started. Um, good morning, everyone. My name is Eileen, and I'd like to thank you for letting us take a moment of your time today to tell you about an idea that we're all very passionate about, a product which uses state-of-the-art technology to bring justice to those who deserve it, a product we call iTranscribe. Today, we'll firstly explain how this idea came about and the challenges it addresses, then move on to the details of our product and outline our business model. We'll then discuss our industry partners, clients, the current and projected market, and finish off by giving you an idea of what's on the horizon for iTranscribe. In 2020 alone, there were 34,287 victims of domestic violence in New South Wales. It's also estimated that eight women a day are being sent to hospital following assault by their partner in their home. These are frightening figures. And what's even more frightening is the fact that COVID-19 has made matters worse. The virus has coincided with a 75% increase in internet searches relating to support for domestic violence. So this problem is no secret. These victims are real people, just like you and me, and they deserve justice and protection. Last year, 15,745 people appeared in court for domestic violence assault, and 70.5% of those people were found guilty. But are the rest really innocent? What if there's a glitch in our system that's letting criminals go scratch free? To know the answer to this, we need to know how domestic violence evidence is gathered. And iTranscribe is lucky enough to have someone on the inside of this. With that, I'd like to pass on to Helen, our law enforcement liaison, who has first-hand experience in the process of gathering domestic violence evidence within the New South Wales Police Force. Thanks, Eileen. Currently in New South Wales, around 60% of interview statements police take with domestic violence complainants are recorded on mobile phones or portable cameras. This form of evidence is called DVEC, or Domestic Violence Evidence in Chief. So these statements take around 15 minutes to complete and are recorded in the wake of domestic violence incidents at the scene of a crime. They're a better form of evidence because they record the emotion of the victim, their injuries and damage at the, at the crime scene. This means they provide a more in-depth picture of what actually happened. They're also, um, oops, sorry. They're also, um, uh, more favourable because the, to the police because they're quick to elicit. So this form of evidence is presented in court unedited. However, one of the main issues with DVEC is that whilst the evidence is compelling and, in, and it's time and cost saving, it pushes the workload to other places such as to the prosecutors or to the police who must transcribe the videos and to transcribing companies. So DVEC are also hard to hear um, often due to the to the what is going on in the background and this affects the evidence quality. So in order for this evidence to work better, two things are required. The first is that transcriptions need to be provided that are confidential, fast and accurate in a manner that's low cost. And the second is that the recordings need to be of high quality. Given this, I'd like to play for you what it would be like at the scene of a crime in the way that it's recorded. Now I'd like to play the same recording for you through our solution. As you can see, it's quite a large distance, a difference. So now I'd like to pass you on to our hardware specialist, uh, Zhang Hong Sao. Okay, thanks, Helen. Uh, behind the accurate transcription results is our customized solution, in which the key is removing noise iTranscribe is composed of two noise filters, the hardware and the software. First, 
we use the cutting edge microphone array to isolate the undesired noise, which is an array of microphones. Second, we train AI algorithms to recognize typical noise for DVAC and further remove those noise. The two filters provide a clear recording for transcription, and we also improve traditional transcription algorithms a little to further increase the accuracy and speed. As a result, our solution saves the time and the money usually spent on labor cost. The combination of the hardware and the software forms our IP of iTranscribe. We plan to incorporate our solution into established body one cameras to quickly enter the market, providing our unique features of very high fidelity, rapid transcription, robust to noise, and our teams works to your needs. So how does our solution work to achieve those features? For the hardware, we design a specific layout which can use 10 microphones to obtain equivalent performance to a traditional array of 30 microphones. As we can see at the bottom of the slide, the figures show the amplification of sounds in the plane. And our new microphone array shows the advantage of receiving sounds only from one direction while canceling noise from all other directions. In this way, iTranscribe can hear us much more clearly using much less microphones. For the software, we collect a large number of noise data that are recorded in typical DVAC scenes, including screaming, whining, crying, dogs barking, cars beeping, etc. Our AI is trained to recognize all these types of sounds and remove them if existed in the recording of iTranscribe. Now we have achieved a great transcription solution, but how do we make it a business? To answer the question, I'd like to hand over to our finance officer, Bongani Mankuli, who is doing his second PhD degree in business and has extensive experience in developing business and finance, as well as building collaborations. Please, Bongani. Thank you, Jehong. Our business model looks into three levels of, of target markets, which includes the New South Wales, Australia, and the, the global market. Now, we conducted research, and we found out that in, in, in New South Wales alone, 58 million was spent on domestic violence, 21.7 billion was spent in Australia, well over a trillion dollars was spent globally. So our business model involves a, re a revenue stream where we anticipate that we will generate revenue through product lease and service contracts within these markets. We anticipate to lease our, our, our units at about $19.99 for the, for, the, for the hardware and the software sub subscription through service contracts will be at about $10.99. Of course, we anticipate to, to be champions of service efficiency and, and partnerships so that we can maximize our, our paid clientele. To be able to, to save the, these markets, we're looking into partnership with some established business partners. For example, the Fujits is our New South Wales partner in terms of supplying the hardware. Exxon and Brain would be our national partners, while Motorola will be our global partners. We're also looking into partnering with, with some clients that involve news agencies, universities, and the police. Now, in, in this business model, we're looking at generating some, some revenues. In our first year of operation, which is around 2023, we are anticipating that in New South Wales, we'll be able to generate revenues of about 2.3 million with a, with, a, with a sizable profitability of about 1.7 million. Then we move into the national market, which is Australia, where we are anticipating to generate revenues of around 11.5 to 12.7 million per annum over a three year period. After that, we'll move into the global markets where we anticipate 
a rise in revenues to about 25.5 million to 29.8 million going into the future. Of course, our horizon uh, ends at 2028, but we'll, we're looking into going beyond that. Now, our other activities are, are outlined. I would then like to pass to Simon, our AI specialist, to take us through the timelines and activities. Thank you. Thanks, Bongani. Uh, to follow on with what Bongani was discussing with our clients and our partners, I'd like to talk about what's on the horizon for iTranscribe. So iTranscribe was conceived in 2021 and yeah, 2021. And for the rest of the year, we plan to conduct a thorough market analysis and initial feasibility studies to ensure that our product can meet the client's needs. 2022 will be a year where we pursue funding opportunities through the iAccelerate Seed Fund, as well as New South Wales grant opportunities. And we plan to perform a proof of concept for the product while we establish partnerships with Fujitsu. So Fujitsu has the market of 41 cameras in New South Wales. So they're our first partner that we plan to build a relationship with. In 2023, we plan to mass manufacture our product after doing product design and development. And we plan to roll out in New South Wales. Uh, in parallel to rolling out in New South Wales, we also plan to lease our product to various other clients, such as universities, legal firms, news outlets, all businesses that can get great value out of a product that can isolate sound and perform very accurate transcriptions. In 2024, we plan to partner with Axon and Brion Defence Systems. The reason for this is they have the market, the rest of the market for Australia in body one cameras. So we plan to do an Australian rollout um, between 2024 and 2027. Uh, after 2027, we plan to establish a partnership with Motorola Solutions, which have the global market for 41 cameras, and we plan to do an international rollout after this. So this is our team. You've heard from all of us today. Uh, iTranscribe is a multidisciplinary multi team, and we play to everyone's strengths. So we can bring everyone together to create a, a very effective solution. So first we have Jiahong, who's our hardware specialist, and he focuses on the microphone arrays. Uh, we have Eileen Wallace, who is our additive manufacturing specialist. So prototyping will involve a lot of 3D printing and stuff like that. So Eileen will be a great asset here. Helen Simpson is our domain expert. So she identified the problem and she has the most intimate knowledge of the problem. And we're gonna use Helen's expertise all throughout the project. Uh, I'm the AI specialist. So I'll be focusing on training AI algorithms and software. And Bongani, of course, is our finance officer, making sure that we're profitable and we're sticking to budgets. So thanks for listening to our presentation. We hope that it's been insightful for you guys. Uh, you're free to contact us on the email below. And you can also find us on social media. Does anyone have any questions? Yeah, can I ask a question? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Simon. Um, brilliant presentation and great work by the team. I think it's fantastic. Um, have you thought about uh, what might happen if a copycat comes along and tries to tries to kind of beat you to the mark? Um, you know, is there some kind of protection or have you got some, some, some ideas in, in place there? Yeah, so we plan to have um, agreements with our partners, uh, initially Fujitsu, uh, where we're providing uh, our solution and partnering with them. And that, so we have exclusive rights to our, um, to our work that we've done uh, because we also plan to parallelly um, lease out our products to other clients. Um, in terms of uh, other companies that start um, that start copying our solution, uh, we plan to be the first ones on the market and capture the audience uh, while you know striking while the iron is hot. So you know people see iTranscribe as the solution for this problem rather than 
other people who come onto the market later. That's great. I think it'll be really important for you to go in really hard and fast and get as much investment in as possible, as quickly as possible. Yeah. Thanks, George. Also have a look at the chat. There are also questions popping up in the chat. Okay, so we have a question from Gordon. So I guess I'll pass on to Bungani for that one. So the question is, um, how are our financial estimates determined? Okay, thank you, Simon. So to, to, to arrive at the projections, what, what basically happened, we did our research on, on how, or in terms of the units, first of all, we look at the units that are, are required in the in the in the in these industries so we established that for example in 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 2023 there's an anticipation that uh, uh, around about uh, 6197 units will be required in terms of uh, board one cameras in the in, in the market so what we did then we, we we therefore looked at also the costs related to to these um uh, cameras for example so now, after establishing the, the, these costs that are related to, the, to, to, to producing and selling, basically our partners are selling at an average of about, I think it's about 100, uh, around $100 per unit. So then what we do then, we, we, we look at the break, what I call the break-even point. First of all, once we, after establishing the break-even point, in other words, at a point where in terms of the units we can sell, we can't make a loss. And then we, we added up a, a, a sort of a markup of around, roughly around a 15% markup. After establishing that markup, then of course we had to, to, to divide uh, that markup per unit to establish the, the, the feasible uh, break-even point for, for a unit. Then that, that amount I multiplied, or we multiply that with, uh, with the total number of units that we anticipate to generate. So the numbers uh, uh, in terms of units, generally they are, they, are, they are determined or they are established from the research that we've done uh, in terms of how many units are required, or at least how many units are being used by, the, by different industry players currently. That's how we, are, we arrived at the, at, the, at the financials. Of course, in terms of uh, establishing the costs, uh, there, there's some, some different elements that are included, like uh, some, some, not a lot of inflation, but uh, mostly the return on investments. Yeah. It's, it's our main, main informer of the projections, basically. Great, thank you. Like any good startup, there's also a bit of this going on, you know, and uh, when it comes to revenue predictions, you know, uh, because you just simply don't know. But what the team has established is a, I think one thing I want to stretch is uh, this is based on Helen's and Yi Hong's PhD work. So, and team, correct me, Simon, I think you're doing in manufacturing. Um, engineering is it mechanical engineering no so that was my bachelor's my phd's oh. in um ai for decision support systems in defense so, so three people three students doing their phd coming together so jiong is working in smart uh, with with um with the microphone all right and so this is this is something that they three three different research streams coming together and saying hey there's an opportunity here so so helen is in organ social sciences uh, and that's that's kind of the the market is is based on her research so just as a bit of a background on this all right can i get a can i get a round of applause uh we got jerry jerry uh child is here from ixl right so you know and she put a comment in great presentation i agree it was, it was really well rehearsed very well executed and uh, you said next year you're going to go into i accelerate to pitch for some funding um, i hope we see you all there we can get this off the ground um 
Excuse me, everyone's listening. No, I'm listening. <laughs> hey, thanks, I transcribe. Brilliant. Um, great way to, to uh, take it away and kick us off. Uh, the next one, the next presentation is on hydrogen 1.23. So I had to learn, I learned a lot, you know, this is what I enjoy. Actually, this is it's like uh, I give, but also I, I learn a lot. Like, because my, and my background is not in engineering. I didn't even know what 1.23 stands for. Normally it's like, you know, industry 1.0 and industry 2.0 and 3.0. And we are going now in, in minor digits, maybe hydrogen 1.231 is coming next. I don't know. Um, so I pass over to team hydrogen 1.23. Um, and uh, I think, is it Aaron? Okay, thanks, Tillman. I hope everyone can see the slides in presentation mode and can hear me. Uh, it's my job to tell you about our product, Hydrogen 123. But the team is here. Let me introduce uh, Sharu, Shanika, Azra, and Thomas. I'm going to tell you about our role in the historic energy transition that is now underway. I'll explain the role that software plays and the problem that software solves. And I'll explain where we're headed and why, if you're an investor, you might like to join us. Asset owners are looking for investment opportunities that will come from this historic transition to net zero. It is my belief that the next 1,000 unicorns, companies that have a market valuation over a billion dollars, won't be a search engine, won't be a media company. They'll be businesses developing green hydrogen, and green agriculture, green steel, green cement. It feels like the world has chosen to remain in the dark about climate change. Inaction has led us to a situation where urgent, massive action is now essential. But the path is beginning to clear and a number of strategies to achieve net zero carbon emissions by 2050 are being implemented. Green hydrogen is one of those strategies. Hydrogen burns clean and it is ideal for use in hard to abate sectors like steel making, fertilizer production and transport. And investors like BlackRock now recognize the inevitable rise of green hydrogen. We can extract hydrogen from water. The device we use to do that is called an electrolyzer. And if we power the electrolyzer with electricity from a renewable source, the process is entirely carbon free. So why aren't we using green hydrogen already? We're starting to, but the problem is we still waste a lot of electricity when we produce it. When we split the water molecule into hydrogen and oxygen, we have to do work on water, electrical work, and that's measured in volts. And if we could split water with perfect efficiency, it would require 1.23 volts. But to make meaningful quantities of hydrogen, we have to supply substantially more than 1.23 volts. We waste electricity. That means the cost of green hydrogen is currently between five and $6 a kilogram far in excess of the cost of producing hydrogen the old dirty way from methane. For green hydrogen to compete as a commercial green fuel, it needs to be produced at around $2 a kilogram. And electrolyzers don't fit very well with electricity generators. That's mainly because renewable energy is intermittent and electrolyzers operate within limited ranges. This poor fit is another source of wasted electricity. It causes capital to be underutilized and increases the cost of green hydrogen. This incompatibility is the opportunity for innovation. We call it interface management, optimizing the connection between the electrolyzer and the electricity generator. The industry has begun to solve this problem with a hardware solution. For example, we can put a battery between the generator and the electrolyzer to provide a buffer. 
but this comes at a capital cost and can actually increase the cost of hydrogen. The interface can be managed with software and the contribution to capital expenditure is negligible. That is exactly what our software, Hydrogen123, does. Our software synchronizes gas production with electricity generation. The software will inform project design, and as projects come online, our software will be operation software. Our software is based on gas crossover modeling, which was a product of our PhD research. The reason electrolyzers and generators don't fit together very well is because of a problem called gas crossover. Inside an electrolyzer, gases intermix unavoidably. This isn't a problem when the electrolyzer operates at capacity because the volume of intermixing gas, or the gas that crosses over, is very low compared to the volume of production gas. But at low loads, for example, when a solar farm is impacted by bad weather, the volume of gas that crosses over is large relative to production gas, and a dangerous gas mixture can result. Obviously, an explosive gas mixture must be avoided at all costs, and often the cost is production because the electrolyzer is simply switched off and we waste electricity. Here's a very simple example of our software in action. An electrolyzer arranged in an array of stacks is fed by a renewable energy generator. A temporary weather event results in a fall of power output. The electrolyzer must be shut down to avoid a dangerous gas mixture. Software control allows selective stack shutdown continuous hydrogen production, and zero waste of electricity. And if the software is used during project design, that red stack can be engineered to be resilient to start up and shut down cycles. The world has embarked on a massive scale up of the green hydrogen industry. The economies of scale that will accompany this scale up expected to help green hydrogen achieve cost parity with so-called grey hydrogen. To illustrate the magnitude of the scale up, the photo on the left is of today's largest electrolyzer. It's in Japan and you can see the configuration of the facility. There's a solar farm in the background, electrolyzer buildings in the foreground and hydrogen storage tanks on the right. That's the biggest we have today. It's a 10 megawatt electrolyzer. But there are some enormous projects planned. Some of them are in Australia. One of them, called the Asian Renewable Energy Hub, is planned for Western Australia. And it will be 1,000 times larger than today's biggest plant. And the funds are starting to flow. The investment pipeline out to 2030 is half a trillion dollars. So we have every reason to believe that this scale up is real and is going to happen. And it's important that it does, for sure, but it's going to magnify existing problems. Small problems today are going to become big problems at scale. One of those problems is utilisation. If we optimistically consider that the incompatibility cost when we connect the electrolyzer to the generator is 1% of capacity, that current scale the dollar cost of that is around $15,000 per annum. But at scale, that cost is over three orders of magnitude higher. The incompatibility cost at scale becomes $17 million per annum. This is the financial opportunity for Hydrogen123 and its investors. We are working through a process to finalize our IP strategy and then we plan to raise funds. We have some technical hires we want to make, a data scientist and a power engineer. And a funding round will allow that development and give us some runway as we formalise relationships with customers. We have generated substantial, valuable IP, and we're working through a process to determine which of that is patentable. 
Much of our IP is embedded in our software code. And so it is probably likely that copyright protection uh, will be our IP protection avenue. There are a number of funding sources available to us. And in particular, there's a number of grants specifically for green hydrogen and clean tech that become available from time to time. We do plan to move forward with an investment partner though, because a number of these grants require matching funding and we're ready to go. We want to develop our product further and start engaging with our customers. We expect our revenue to come from two sources. We will consult with green hydrogen project developers when they're in their design and development phase. And as these projects come online towards the end of the decade, we will share revenue with our customers. Our fee will be 10% of the revenue that our software creates for our customers. This business strategy aligns Hydrogen 123 with the largest, most important, most urgent infrastructure rollout in history. The figures on the screen illustrate revenue at, with our 10% share for one project from one customer. And that's an ongoing revenue. So it becomes cumulative over time as the project stays online and as more projects come online. There are no incumbents in this space. Electric grid operators have grid balancing expertise, but they have no hydrogen expertise. So electricity generators and electrolyzer manufacturers are gonna to have to figure this out for themselves if a solution is not made available to them. That represents a hole in the market, a hole that hydrogen 123 is ideally equipped to fill. The banks are aware of this opportunity. Macquarie Bank in its paper late last year highlighted precisely this opportunity. New opportunities for hydrogen producers and businesses that can develop the software needed to integrate hydrogen into our energy networks. That is exactly what Hydrogen123 does. The team would love for you to get in touch. The best way to do that is at hydrogen123.com. Go to the website and click on contact us. We are a team of five PhDs but our backgrounds and our expertise are about as diverse as you could imagine. What the team has in common is a desire to make a meaningful difference to net zero by 2050. Hydrogen 123 will do that by connecting the world to green hydrogen. And we invite you to join us. So I guess uh, fire away with your questions if you have them. The team and I will do our best to, to answer you. So in the, in, for Hydrogen 123 to work, um, you mentioned that you need to be able to switch on and off individual cells. Is that something that's already a capability or is that a capability that needs to be de developed and with its own capital uh, and investment costs? Um, are you asking, do we have that capability? No, if, that, if, if that's already being developed and is that someone you're partnering with or is it already there in, in the existing plans? To well, I would, I would imagine that electrolyzer developers are looking at this, um, but I doubt the urgency has been there because at scale, it hasn't been such an important problem. So it's a bit hard to know exactly what's going on behind the, the curtains. Um, but we believe there is a first mover advantage here. Um, and if we don't do it, then it will be getting done by electrolyzer manufacturers. Um, team, feel free to, to answer these questions. Um, there's, there's one in the chat from Attila. Uh, the biggest revenue loss is during the night. What does the electrolyzer stack do from seven to nine? Um, yeah, good question. So the, 
The example I gave um, with a solar farm was, was a fairly basic example. The, the way these mega projects um, are taking shape is they'll be hybrid generators, wind and solar. Um, so the Aging Renewable Energy Hub is a perfect example of that. The, the location is what we call a coastal desert. So there's lots of sun and also lots of wind. Uh, and actually that's one of the things we plan to develop. That's why we want to hire a data scientist is we want a database of renewable energy output profiles from these sites around the world. Um, these um, coastal deserts um, uh, and, the, and the renewable energy resource act them up, uh, the oil maps of the 21st century, really. Um, a location that, that you know, powers wind turbines during the night and is augmented by sunshine during the day uh, is gold. Uh, but there's still fluctuations and there's still a need to manage the interface between the generator and the electrolyzer. Um, Professor Spink said, it seems like a fairly simple task to switch cells off when power is low. So is there a cleverness in the software? Um, yeah, I deliberately um, painted a, a simple picture to explain what we're, what we're up to. Uh, the, the complexity is modeling gas crossover. Um, in a cell and in a stack. Um, and I guess that's the, the IP that we have. Um, uh, understanding the factors that influence crossover and predicting it um, and simulating it. Uh, it's, it's more complex than turning a switch on and off. Um, Simon says hydrogen one, two, three will control, will have control over the operation of electrolyzers. How will the software design guarantee that electrolyzers always operate safely? Yeah, good question, Simon. Um, we, we have to be sure, sure, I guess, that the responsibility for, for something going wrong doesn't lie solely at our feet, um, that our software does what we, promise it will do, um, we, we will have to think through the, the legal aspects of this. I mean, we, we will want to provide some warranties to customers for sure, um, but we're not going to be a vehicle for them to hand over uh, responsibility for complete responsibility for the safety of their projects. Yeah, we actually have built into our costs as well, a redundancy to reliability engineers, but that would also be a risk assessment we'd have to do. Um, that's just, you know, you have to do verification testing, uh, validation testing. Um, that all comes to the field work. So, yeah, that's part of the, uh, the experimentation to get to TRL9. Thanks, Tom. So, sorry, in the background, I have a really old computer. I, I did the background before, but apparently I needed a uh, dual core processor, which this computer doesn't have, because I run off vintage hardware. So, apologies, but hydrogen 1.23. I think going back to George's question about partnerships, um, I think there's one company um, in Australia, Verdant uh, Earth Technologies in uh, New South Wales, and there's also another Europe-based company called Enaptra. So uh, we've been in touch with them uh, with regards to our software and compatibility. So that's a discussion we, that's an ongoing discussion with them. But uh, from the research that at least what I've done, um, this is an area I guess they haven't dived into yet, uh, but which they are interested in. So it's just, um, we are in conversation with them. Thanks, Sharif. Yeah. That's interesting. I, I imagine there's um, an opportunity to collaborate also with software companies that are predicting um, the I guess the, the the requirement for the hydrogen and the the likelihood that you know solar cells will be receiving the sunlight. So I, I guess that it, and the finances of feeding into the grid and pulling out of the grid. It's all actually a very complex thing in which your part is you know a, a small but critical part. And, right. And so partnership. both these renewable energy companies, especially Enaptra, is also um, dealing with software. So it's mostly on a. Um, uh, not necessarily the filling the gap that we are discussing about, but because they are already involved in software, I think it's a good 
uh, opportunity for us to sort of merge with them. Uh, yeah, yeah. 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 Great. Uh, we have a question in the chat. Uh, can the other members of the team explain what they will bring to this initiative and their role? Um, so I guess uh, I shuffle patents for a living and I set up companies. So that's that's me. Find LinkedIn. And Azra, you want to, Azra and Charu, maybe you can explain your role hi yeah so i'll be in charge of the human resource management yeah, and dealing with customers as well yeah that's my role uh hi uh my name is charu i'll be dealing with the software uh part mainly uh, uh i'll be working on the different parameters on which the electrolyzer operate and the grid parameters and i'll be collecting all the data and then link the software accordingly basically the modeling part thanks charu thanks team i also want to uh, maybe also to jump in here for to answer jenny's question because the when we start off we're looking at each other's research and then it takes a while till the final business model crystallizes so with hydrogen 1.23 we started off with an intermediate battery to just keep the to keep the um, electrolyzer going during during darkness or you know, when there's no sunlight or no wind so we don't have to shut it down this is kind of where the conversation started and then we we pivot and we move and then the final outcome is a software but to get to that outcome you need the discussion within the team and so don't underestimate everyone's contribution to get to that final point. There is a question from Linda about distributed energy systems and behind the meter. Um, I, I guess I can make a comment there. Um, so uh, grid balances um, are probably the most likely um, organizations to, to run with uh, a, a competitive product to us. But actually, um, hydrogen is often not grid connected. Um, these projects are remote um, uh, and there is no, no grid connection. Uh, so they do have their own specific flavor, green hydrogen projects. Okay. Uh, on terms of the road, though, one of the things we we're actually looking at, uh, CRC grants, um, uh, we actually think we might be able to partner up with the Smart Seas Initiative uh, with the Commonwealth Government because obviously the systems, um, a lot of what we're doing is essentially um, IoT uh, in, in a sense, you know, we're able to scale up and scale down systems. So there's grant application there. Um, there's, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of, you know, MVP grants, um, tech vouchers. Um, we actually see a lot of roadmaps in terms of partnership and collaboration between uh, Treasury New South Wales, uh, Infrastructure New South Wales, from the New South Wales Government. Um, and we do that partnership with the University of Wollongong. So we haven't um, come up with a, with a full scale business plan, but I've been in the background uh, uh, alongside my work colleagues, uh, workshopping basically a, a very a very small scale um, uh, project plan we could do uh, to, to get the, the ball rolling on this. We could ramp this up probably beginning of next year. So uh, um, yeah, I mean, if you, if you want, happy to uh, keep working on that, um, I'm come back to the panel. Uh, the new year and, and show you something more more comp more comprehensive. That'd be great. Thank you. Yep. Okay. Last round of applause for Team Hydrogen One Point Two Three. I think excellent presentation, and um, there is a lot more complexity in in the algorithms. We also talked about including weather data and yeah anyway so there's 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 a there's a lot that can go into these simulation models and brilliant presentation and really well executed um because it's really hard to also communicate to people that don't understand hydrogen in in that 
depth that you do. So uh, it was very understandably for me what you're trying to do and, and how hydrogen kind of works. Please don't send any technical questions to me. Still, still not that comfortable, but I know what the 1.23 stands for at least, right? Learn something. Is a really interesting and pre yes, I, I agree, Linda, and um, feasible. And I hope uh, I hope you're going to take this forward um, in consultation, of course, with your PhD supervisors. Because we all want you to complete, right? Um, last team is um, Team Carly on Shark Dieter. Is that how you pronounce it? Yeah, Shark Dieter. Okay. And it's, uh, it's, I like it a lot because it's so different to the, to the first two. And uh, I know you had a lot of fun in the process. So over to you, Carly. All right. Hi, everyone. So my name is Carly Baker, and I'm the founder and the CEO of Shark Deter. And I'm so excited to share with you this product that we've spent some time developing. So I don't know about all you surfers and you ocean swimmers out there, but when I'm out in the surf, I am terrified. I'm terrified of sharks. And what's probably the most terrifying thing for me is that even if I get nipped by a shark, then it will destroy my livelihood, you know, because I live to surf, I live to swim. Um, so I just thought maybe I could create a product that will, that would kind of ease the minds of people that are similar to me and people who are even more scared of sharks that completely avoid the water altogether. So first, let me introduce you to Mick Fenton. Mick Fenning is a pro Australian surfer. And back in 2015, he was um, uh, in a surf comp. You know, the cameras were on him, the lifeguards were on patrol, there was a crowd, um, there was a beach filled with the crowd, there was boats out um, on surveillance. And what do you know? He's nipped by a shark. He's attacked by a shark. So on live television, we see him attacked by a great white, sh white shark. So it just goes to show that even the highest patrolled beaches don't prevent shark attacks. And what's uh, even more uh, interesting, or well, probably not interesting, but it would be um, uh, concern in terms of shark attacks is that surfing is becoming more attractive to Australians. So it's, um, it was shown through the sales. So we have a leap between May 2019 and May 2020 that um, surfing has increased by over 3000%. And right now it's worth $2.72 billion alone in Australia. The general trend as well is that we, we've, we've seen surfing take to the Olympics in Tokyo 2020. And when sports become um, viewed in the Olympics, then people will want to start to learn this sport, start to participate in competitions um, because of the idea that maybe one day they can make it to the Olympics. And what we saw in December 2020 is that there was a shortage in surfboards on the Gold Coast. So what we believe in at Shark Deter is that everyone should be able to go out in the, in the ocean um, without the, the worry of being attacked by a shark. So the seawater has so many benefits. I know when I'm out in the ocean, just sitting on my board, I'm just thinking, wow, this is like so relaxing, so amazing. But um, if I had that, that fear of the potential shark attack taken away, then my anxiety, would, my anxiety levels would be so low that it would just um, really promote my health and well-being. So what we, what we propose at Shark Deter is to create an eco-friendly coating that could be applied to surfboards to protect people from the potential shark attacks. So this, 
this coating would be applied like you're applying wax. So you apply with your, you um, wax your surfboard maybe every three months. It would, it would coincide with the waxing of your board. So it works by using the ions, sodium chloride or seawater um, to promote a flow along this conductive coating. And this results in conductivity so that it kind of blinds the shark and repels it away from you to um, provide this level of safety to the um, surfer. Now, before I indulge into more of our business, I'm going to introduce you to my fabulous team. So I'm just the idea, I just came up with this idea, but these guys were the brains behind this whole project. So I have this group of material scientists who have expertise in a wide range of areas. So we have Ben, um, he's quite good in the management side of things, so he can push forward our research and development. We have Sujani who has a background in finance, so she really helped to put our business plan together. We have Nwangi who is um, very experienced in marketing and advertising, so she can push our business forward to help us um, deliver our sales and goals. And we have Ying, who is more of a people's person. So she um, is head of our human resources department. Okay. So now we have this window of opportunity. So we have 2.5 million Australian surfers, which worldwide we have about 35 million, which has grown to 54 million. We have 107 surf schools. So this equates to 420,000 um, annual participants. And we have 303 surf life saving clubs. And through my connection with surf life saving club, um, sorry, Australian surf life saving, we proposed a kind of contract where they would subscribe to us for three years, um, which provides us with this ongoing income for the first three years to get us off the ground. So the pricing system works like this. So one can would be worth $65, right? So one can would be um, one, so you apply the can um, and you would need a second can after three months, right? So you apply the can as you apply your wax or you apply, sorry, you apply the um, coating like you would apply the wax and then you would need a replacement can. So there's a subscription-based service available where we send out these cans to you every three months. Um, so this would be worth $150 per year, which you would save because the price of one can would be approximately $50 instead of 65. So now um, what we ask from you is an investment of 500 grand, which will be fed to us over the nine month um, research and development period. This is to help us get us off the ground. So we do a little bit more field work. Um, we set up our factory. We have some um, wages to um, pay. And in return, we offer you a 20% stake in our business. So our timeline involves nine months of further research and development to provide a quality assurance to our customers. And we're currently in the process of filing a patent. So by December, 2022, we expect to have the first rollout of our cans, which will be sent to Australian Surf Life Saving, which is approximately 15,000 in the first year. So the following year, December, 2023, we expect a second rollout where we have more um, customers purchasing online. We have more sale of subscriptions to other, um, to the wider surfing community. And through December, 2024, we expect sales to continue business as usual. So by March, 2025, we hope to have um, refunded, or not refunded, but paying back the 500 grand plus interest, 
which allows us um, the remaining cash flow to be invested back into our company. So this may be through licensing our IP to major companies such as Firewire Surfboards. Um, and then we have this opportunity to potentially expand our company. So we have other water sports, we have swimming, we have leisure fishing, and we could essentially use our cash flow to create a new product similar to our coding, which could be applied to swimming, swimwear, goggles, caps, um, and the wider uh, water sport, wider water sports. This um, we expect by 2027, December 2027, that we can take this um, company global with an opportunity for further expansion. So we can apply this film to other, um, other marine activities such as in fish netting. So we're protecting the um, sharks because they're being repelled away. They're not getting caught up in the nets. Uh, we can apply it to the bottom of um, boats, which could essentially repel the sharks and other marine creatures such as stingrays to prevent the bycatch in the, um, in the fishing nets. It could also provide some anti-fouling of the bottom of the boats to prevent um, the uh, accumulation of microorganisms as seen in this picture here. So just to reiterate that the payback period will be two years and three months. So after this period, that's when we should have significant cash flow that we can reinvest this money into our company, we can further grow and expand. And within six years, we're expecting to have about $4.2 million um, of um, cash flow. Now, this is um, a final point that I'm trying to emphasize um, why this product will be great in the, in the market. Okay, so there was a tourism survey conducted pre-COVID where they did a survey of people um, from China, the UK, USA, Japan, New Zealand. So these are the five major countries that are responsible for $20 billion of um, the, the flow, um, cash flow in Australia from tourism, right? So what they found is that 14% of the people considered not coming to Australia just based on our, the shark, a potential shark attack. And I know I have a lot of international friends from Spain, France, um, Germany, and they all say the same thing. Are you afraid of sharks? So the media has definitely um, increased this stigmatism of sharks. Uh, so that's also what we saw, what they saw in 42% of respondents. They have mm. heard of shark attacks in Australia, which is crazy because the rate is probably quite low and um, probably the waves are more dangerous than, um, or more um, statistically likely to cause injury than a shark attack, right? So of all the respondents in this survey, that were surfers, 51% of these, these people were worried of shark attacks. So it just shows that some of these people were actually um, thinking to participate in sport-based activities, but they were worried of shark attacks in Australia if they came here. And this equates to a loss of $2.9 billion in tourism in Australia. So, um, so, Therefore, I think that this Hello, Sudo. we at Shark Deter Please, think. Can you? <laughs> this one, I don't know. So, so, so we at Shark Deter think that um, this will provide a great level of safety in the water. It will encourage more people to not only want to come to Australia, but also will encourage the Australian community to take to the surf you know, participate in more surfing competitions, surfing activities, even paddling or swimming in the open water. Uh, if you would like to hear more about our um, company, please follow us on social media or visit our website, www.sharkdeter.com.au.
Thank you. Thanks, Caroline. The great presentation. Really, like that's what I said. I was, I was so, I was really blessed with like three great teams, and the students were just uh, amazing to work with. So that was fantastic. We got the first question coming in from Simon. Have you tested the coating to see if the technology actually works and what would be your IP position? And maybe you can also ask the rest of the team to come in on this because I know it was a team effort, even though the team, not the whole team has presented. Yeah, so um, the technical um, side of this product, I'm going to head it, um, hand it over to my uh, Chief Technical Officer, Ben. If you would like to answer this, please. Yeah, absolutely. Um, sorry, I don't have a camera at the moment. Um, so with our product, part of our nine months of research and development, uh, about $30,000 of our um, investment that we're asking for would be directly to testing that um, practicality of it. Although at a small scale, we can see that it does have the properties to, to work, um, but it would be something that would need to be scaled up. So Attila is a seasoned fisherman, so he, he wants to attract sharks. No, he, might, he wants to attract fish. I, mean. I guess um, we could potentially, um, uh, so the coating that we're trying to provide would have a higher current such to repel the shark, but I guess we could manipulate it such that we're attracting sea sharks. Ben, what do you think? Yeah, there's definitely the possibility there. Um, what we're essentially working with is, um, without getting too much into intellectual property, is essentially creating an electrical current that would scare away sharks. Um, so it's definitely more practical to either send fish or sharks away as opposed to um, the, the opposite and attracting them. Um. Also, uh, sharks, I forgot to mention, but sharks are re um, highly electroreceptive. So the human body or any sort of um, organism in the ocean, it, would, it lets out a little bit of um, ionic current from our, um, from our bodies. So the shark, that's what kind of attracts the shark to us. Um, so if we're giving off this high electric signal, it repels the shark because it's like, oh, what's going on here? It's kind of like a blinding light. And they've done um, uh, immense research on this um, phenomenon with sharks and stingrays. Um, so I'm not too sure if this would work with fish. That's why I'm saying like, it could be cool if we had it, um, eventually we cr could create this product in a fish netting, right? So we're preventing the bycatch of um, sharks and stingrays, which is a major problem in um, uh, fisheries. Uh, that, uh, yeah. Um, I lost my track because I got distracted by the questions. Um, yeah, so the, the answer to the fish thing is I don't think it would be feasible to use this film to attract fish. Definitely. Um, jumping onto Jenny's question here, she's asked, um, does the shark actually have to bite or how close it needs to be? Um, in short, the shark definitely does not need to be close enough to take a bite, although getting that exact range would be, again, something that our full scale test would definitely be identifying. What about the IP position then? Is there something patentable here? Um, yeah, so we have applied for a patent for this um, product and it's currently in the process. So we do have IP um, um, associated with this. Uh, also, in terms of the um, environmental impact, um, so the coding, it's like, it's got polymer in it, but it's kind of a matrix. So that was one of our first issues um, was 
environmental safety. And we found that um, once it's coded onto a surfboard, it will not, um, it, it's kind of like the wax, it, it doesn't disperse off into the um, water. So it's quite safe in terms of um, uh, um, it's, yeah, it, like it won't destroy the planet. That's what I'm trying to say. And of course, with all of these things, a lot of further testing needs to be done, right? Yeah. Mm. George was asking the price point. People might pay a thousand dollars to save their life. Um. Yeah, I I guess so. We thought about that that we could make these cans a hundred dollars or whatever, but we're not really. Um, Maybe I could hand this over to someone who can better answer it. But I know from my perspective, if I saw a can that was worth $50, that could like keep my mind at ease, I would want to buy it. But if it's any more than $50, I would be like, nah, like, oh, I would just risk it. This, um, yeah. Did anyone want to weigh in on that? Yeah, I can definitely add. It was just something that we needed to cover our costs and definitely make a profit so that we could do that further research and development. Um, but we wanted it to be attractive and actually available to a large event of people. We didn't want to be um, sh uh, shortening our market opportunity um, because of a price point and being greedy. Thanks. So how much is, is this polymer? Uh, I've got no idea. They're cheap to produce, is it? Like, what do you like? I'm, I know it's, uh, it's way beyond question for, for what we're trying to achieve here, but I'll, I'll just, I'm really mindful, like, this will be interesting. Yeah. Um, so, Sajani so did a financial kind of projection to see, like, the cost of wages to produce the film, the cost of um, the polymer to, to produce. Sajani, so did you want to? Um, yeah, yeah. Thanks, Kalyan. Thanks, Dilman, for the question. Uh, cost of a can is $30. Uh, so the profit from a can varies between $30 and, sorry, $20 and $35. Uh, depending on the sales channel, like individual customers serve life saving and uh, sub subscriptions. Right. Um, thank you all. I have one question because a lot of some, sometimes these things go a bit fall under the radar and this is actually across all three teams. Um, how, <clears throat> how did you enjoy this, this journey? Was it any valuable? Was it meaningful? Or was it just a complete waste of your time uh, towards your PhD? It was super fun. I really liked it. And it does get me thinking um, in a different mind frame of like not only presenting, but just like the work that I'm doing, like how I could use that work and create like some product that people would want. It's, yeah, I thought it was valuable. I would quickly comment that the, the course, the process just made made it real to me. So the idea that we could actually create a startup and pitch it and talk to investors, it doesn't seem impossible. Uh, so, you know, we learned about the, the process, but I guess I got some belief that you know, why not me? And um, having people come along to talk to us like George um, was part of that. Um, that's my comment. Uh, for me, I uh, I think this is very meaningful. As I was, uh, I hope I will be close to my PhD degree. Yeah, I have said this for a few months, but it still doesn't finished. Uh, uh, it's great to uh, um, take, uh, make my research uh, be part of our project. And our product tries to include everyone's uh, research topic. And the most favorite part of this uh, program is the teamwork. 
yeah, as we, as our team uh, said to each other in the beginning, we are a system. Uh, I think we stick to it. And uh, all of us are very, yeah, although we are only students, but we are all busy. <laughs> so we try to find some time to uh, do it together. Uh, this is the most valuable thing. And we polish the business idea uh, guided by human and professors. Even George provides a lot of help. And uh, those are all meaningful. We learn something. I just wanted to add to that on the non-technical side of things. Um, I think I'm just really grateful the course went ahead um, in the middle of lockdown and everything. It was really nice to just work in a group again and like have a regular group meeting and catch up with people. So yeah, thanks for everything. It's been really great. I tell you, the, the, they had no idea this question was coming. This is not staged, right? I just, I just need to know, and I, because I think also the university needs to know that there's some value in what we're doing, and uh, I'm, I'm proud of three, all three teams done really, really well, and uh, let's take it further, you know, with permission of your supervisors, just touch base with them, just so they're cool, you know, just, just saying. But uh, there's, there's quality and there's opportunity. You know, and uh, not always succeed, but uh, I told you like how many times I've been through that cycle, but you learn every time and then sometimes it's just clicks and then you're you're off if that's if that's part of your journey. All right, I pass back to Sam. Uh, that wraps up our session and we actually managed to fill up the whole one and a half hours, which is awesome. <laughs>